please join me in giving a very warm welcome to this chilly city, to Liz Zegmeister. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I, um, I can't top that, so um, I uh, was going to start with a Trump joke, but I'm mic'd and I'm streaming, so I can't even sort of start with, uh, with that. I'm glad you warmed up the audience then instead, but thank you so much for that, that introduction. And thanks to Sabrina for all the work that you did in getting me here. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. I'm going to talk about a project that I'm working on with a graduate student at Vanderbilt, Oscar Castareña. We've been looking at um, issue agendas and uh, looking at the determinants of issue agendas and then also looking at how the public's issue agendas uh, connect to legislative agendas um, and, and sort of when uh, and to what consequence. So I'm going to present one paper from that, from that broader project. The question of, of the public's agenda we think is important uh, because it is central to certain dynamics of representation. So we would argue that understanding what determines the public's agenda helps us to understand these issues of representation. This is because in theory, the public's agenda shapes legislative agendas or priorities. And to the extent that it doesn't, then failure to find correspondence between the elites agenda and the public's agenda tends to elicit democratic dissatisfaction in the public. So in this part of the, of the project that I'm going to present today, we look at the determinants of you know, fa what factors determine the public's issue priorities. And specifically, we look at the prioritization of security issues. We do this for a number of reasons. One, we think there's a unique dynamic to security issue prioritization. Two, we tend to focus on a part of the world that has seen an increase in the extent to which people are prioritizing national security issues. So recently in Latin America, in the Latin American region, according to the America's Barometer, we found that on average, about one out of three individuals puts an issue related to national security at the top of the agenda. So crime, violence, gangs, or some related issue uh, would be one that would code into this general basket of security. And we see that about one out of three respond to this question in the survey with a security issue, saying that that's the issue that should be at the top of the national agenda. And this makes sense in Latin America, because Latin America is a region that is coping with significantly high levels of crime and violence. Latin America and the Caribbean region hold about 8% of the world's population. 8% of the world's population, and yet one out of every three homicides occurs in the Latin America and Caribbean region. These are homicide rates per 100,000 people. I have Canada here, 1.6, so I feel very safe. And you should all feel safe because there are no baguettes in the room. <laughs> um, we have a slightly higher, but still just marginally higher rate in the United States. In Brazil, the rate is 28.3. In Colombia, it's 33.8. In Venezuela, it was 53.7. It is likely higher at this point, but that's the last data point that I, that I pulled off of the Igarape Institute's uh, homicide map. And that number there, 85.5, is an astronomically high number. Uh, that's Honduras. We can also look at these issues of crime and violence by looking at crime victimization rates. So in the America's Barometer survey, we ask people, have you been the victim of any type of crime in the past 12 months? And to make sure that we're sort of giving them a chance to pause and think, we list out a number of types of crime, we say, or any other type of crime, and we give them a chance to, to respond. One out of every five adults, on average, reports having been recently victimized by, by crime. Of course, these rates vary significantly, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. This matters for a lot of reasons. Uh, there's the human direct toll. There's a toll to the economy. We see that crime and violence affect people's daily lives. So about two out of five people on average in the region report that they alter their daily walking routes to avoid dangerous areas. We ask people on the survey if they have intentions to leave the country. 
uh, for, for any of a number of re reasons in the next couple of years. And we see a high degree of, of we so, see a significant impact of having been uh, victimized by crime. So the blue bar is those who have been the victim of a crime in, in the past year, and the orange bar is those who have not. And you see that there's a, a substantial difference in people's intentions to emigrate conditional on whether or not they've been the victim of a crime. If I had the data here to show you what happens to that blue bar when people have been the victim of a crime more than once in the past year, you can imagine it goes up even higher quite sharply. Um, so these issues matter. We want to know what determines the prioritization of security issues on the national agenda because we think that's a question that's of, of interest more broadly for these dynamics of representation, but also because this is a pressing problem in the region. So we're curious to know what determines the degree to which people in the public say, yes, put this at the top of the agenda, right? So that's the research question. Now, given what I just said, the obvi most obvious suspect for prioritization of security issues would be an individual's own experiences, right? But we argue in the paper that this is an insufficient explanation. Uh, we can look at it in two ways. One, the individual's personal experiences, these crime victims that I, that I they mentioned. Um, but theoretically, that's, that's, that's an anemic explanation. It's theoretically anemic because we know from the economic voting literature that people tend not to connect their own personal experiences to national evaluations. So theoretically, it doesn't seem to really get us there. Empirically, it also doesn't get us there. Many more people prioritize security, put it at the top of the agenda, than our recent crime victims. Right? So that's, that's point one. The second thing that we might think about is, well, maybe it's not people's own direct experiences, but the experiences of those around them. Because also taking from the, socio, or from the economic voting literature, we have this sociotropic uh, framework that suggests that people, while they may not put their own uh, direct experiences into their national evaluations, they do tend to take into consideration what happens to those in communities, into the, in, in the community to which they belong. Right, so that may that may be the case, but it's also going to be an insufficient explanation because crime is extremely pocketed. It's extremely localized. So that means that there actually are not sort of a sufficient number of communities to account for this dynamic that we see in the region, where a fairly high percentage of people prioritize security issues. What do I mean by crime being very pocketed or localized? In this study by Sherman, Garten, and and Berger. They looked at Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they found that in the time period that they were looking at in the, in the data that they had, over 50% of police calls were made from just 3% of the spots that made up the, the database uh, in, their, in their study of the city. So crime is pocketed. What does that really look like? Here's a crime map from New York City. And you can see here two crime pockets uh, for, for New York City. Here is Los Angeles. You can see that there are sort of two crime pockets uh, by my circle, but I didn't circle the, the other one. This is the, the one that you, you know, with, the, with all the violent crime, right? What does it look like here? Well, looks like there's sort of a, a crime pocket right there. I have no idea where we are, so I don't know if that's like where, where we are right now. Um, but uh, but that's, that, that's from the, uh, that's <laughs> it is mainly down one street. This is just robberies, and this is from a, um, a crime map that you can find online. It's not updated all that frequently, so the last um, available data were from November of, of last year. So this is looking between January and November, and I just drew a circle around where the, the, the it seemed to be the densest. Um, crime is also pocketed in Latin America. So here is a map of Guatemala. We ask people whether or not someone in their household has been affected by, by crime in the past year. And here we're just looking at that, and we can see that the percentage of individuals who report that crime affected their household in the past year is, is highest in Guatemala City. It's substantially higher than it is in other parts of the country. All right. And there are pockets within pockets within pockets. So if you go to, you know, down to the block, you'll see that the blocks vary, but you also see that regions vary. So from, for most of the uh, rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about crime pockets in this way by these larger regions. So let me uh, give you an example of, 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 of um, well, let me give you the example of Uruguay. Um, 
like Guatemala, it also has a crime pocket in the, in the capital city of Montevideo. So violent crime in Montevideo is, is greater than two times that of the interior, right? Uh, armed robbery in Montevideo is more than five times uh, that of the interior. And you can see the, the sort of just basic differences in, in general crime victimization rates from the America's Barometer Survey here on the screen, okay? So if all that mattered were people's individual experiences and their sort of assen assessment of the community around them, then what we should see is that the prioritization of security for what issue should top the national agenda would be highest in Montevideo, though orange bar, right, and lowest in the interior. And what we find is that they're even, okay? So what is, what is happening out there in public opinion? What kind of process can account for this homogenation of, of, of security prioritization in the public? And that's what we wanted to uh, examine in this particular paper. We can also look at the whole region and we find a similar pattern, okay? Um, Across the, across the region, across Latin America, crime victimization varies more within country than does concern about crime. So there's more variation, there's more pocketing of crime than there is prioritization of crime and security. So here's a map of crime victimization in the past year, um, and then here's a map of crime as the, or security as the most important problem. And it's hard to see here, we've done the quantitative test of this, if, it's sort of what it does, and this is backed up by the quantitative test, is there's more homogenation within country of this most important problem response than there is of crime victimization. So something's happening to bring the public into some level of agreement over what the most important problem is, right? Not that they're all saying that crime is, but that the rates in each region are similar. And so that's the question that we ask then, what's doing that? And our answer is, it's the media, it's news consumption. Okay. And a particular dynamic to news consumption that I'll, that I'll lay out now. So we start with this notion of news because Iyengar and Kinder and others have told us that the news sets the national agenda. Well, we're looking at the national agenda, so we need to bring news in. Okay, so we s believe that there should be some type of relationship between consuming the news and prioritizing security. Now, why is that? The news, of course, contains information on a lot of issues but it does contain information on, on security. Uh, there's a study of the media in Latin America finds that about a quarter of homepage space for a top Latin American news outlet is taken up by issues related to crime or other, other sort of relevant issues. Um, I pulled this off of Reforma the other day, the main uh, news outlet in Mexico, and you know, conveniently in this one screenshot, a quarter of the page is taken up by, by news of crime and, and violence. Um, consumption of crime is high, of crime news is higher, right? Because of a general propensity towards negative information, that is the, a universal human tendency, that tendency means that people consume information about crime and violence more to a, to a greater degree than it is there in the news, right? So we can look at what proportion of, of a homepage space takes, uh, uh, is taken up by issues related to crime and insecurity. We can also know that that, that is consumed to a higher degree than the other news stories. Well, how do we know that? Because scholars have studied um, clicking and, and accessing uh, news stories. Right? Our argument isn't about the level of, of, of information that people um, are dosed with when it comes to the, the news site itself, but rather what, how much news in general they consume because they're gonna come across it, right? So it's like secondhand smoke. You're, if you know, you're near it, you're gonna come across it, whether you're looking for it or not. And, and so we argue that news consumption increases prioritization of security issues. But we bring back in this notion of crime context so crime context is that, that area in which you, you live, and we think that that does matter, right? Here we're drawing on the economic voting scholarship and the framework that they offer us with respect to sociotropic considerations. I mean that the, the broader environment in which you live should influence your assessment of what the most important problem is. It may be because that also directly affects you. You may, you may not have been victimized in the past year, but your probability is certainly higher if you, you live in that area. So there may be a personal side to the story as well. Um, but I think crime, crime context matters. Then what we do in the paper is we interact these two, theoretically and then later empirically. So we argue that, that there should be an interaction between the context in which you live, how, um, 
how, how much crime there is or how little crime there is, and your news consumption. Our argument is that news consumption should matter more where crime rates are lower. Our argument is this. If you live in an area that is saturated with crime, then you hardly need the news to tell you that this is a major problem facing your country. But if you live in a low crime area, like out in the interior in, Mon in uh, Uruguay, then the news helps you to understand that this is a major problem for the country. And so it sets the, the, you know, helps you to set the agenda or sets the agenda for you, however you want to look at that, whether or not you're an active agent in this or not. Others have made similar arguments, but about fear of crime. And I'm going to address that later. We don't think that this actually is, is quite right. There is a rival hypothesis uh, that we'll implicitly test, which is that news about um, crime or, or, or the media resonates more with people who, for whom crime is more relevant. If that were the case, we would find the opposite interaction to what we're proposing. The idea is that people in high crime areas are more sensitive to that news and sort of activates their, their attitudes to a greater degree than it would otherwise. But that's not our, our argument. We think that people who live in low crime areas are the ones who shift their priorities upon hearing news of, of crime elsewhere. We do bring into this model victimization, people's personal experiences with victimization, because we think it does matter. Uh, we just think that it should only matter at the margins. So these are our key variables and our expectations. Uh, we have um, a set of variables for individual experiences. We have the crime victimization measure that I mentioned earlier. We also have a measure of people's economic situation. We ask in the survey whether or not, over the past two years, the individual's household has experienced income loss. So if they have, we code them as, as having experienced personal uh, household level income deterioration. And we expect that these should only matter at the margin. Right? If you've been the victim of crime, you should be more likely to prioritize security. If you are controlling for that, if you have experienced economic uh, uh, deterioration or, or loss, then you should be less likely to prioritize security because you're worried about other things, your household income. We expect context to have a moderate effect. And here we also look at both security and, and, and the economic situation within the region in which you live. So we use a, an indicator of the subnational crime rate and an indicator of the economic condition of your subregion, which we also take from the survey data. And I'll explain that in, in a minute. Then what we're really interested in is this cross-level interaction. We think that there should be between crime context and the individual's uh, media consumption, how much news they're, they're consuming. So one reason that we uh, look at Latin America for this paper is because we're interested in the region. Another reason is because of the data that we have uh, through the America's Barometer Project to bring to bear on this uh, set of hypotheses. We need a measure of sub-regional uh, crime rates. Uh, we need a measure of, of, of the subregional measure of the state of the economy. And we can get that from the America's Barometer. So the America's Barometer, as Patrick mentioned, is a uh, regional survey project in the Americas. We cover now 34 countries total in the project. In this round of the America's Barometer, we're going to cover 29 countries. Uh, the, the, the current round goes between 2016 and 2017. We used to be sort of an on the year kind of project, but we've grown so large in terms of the number of countries that we cover that it takes us a bit longer to get through a, a round. So we're in the field right now in Mexico, Peru, Guatemala. We've finished surveys in um, about uh, two thirds of the region. And we have just a few more countries to, to survey. We um, conduct a minimum, or we, we collect data from a minimum of 1,500 respondents in each country. That's the sample size. Uh, we, and these are nationally representative surveys. They're face-to-face, -face, I put an asterisk there, they're face-to-face -face in every country uh, except the US and Canada, which we include in the project, but we do those surveys uh, online. In every other country, like you see here, the picture is of a pretest in Jamaica. We do the surveys face-to-face -face using mobile devices. So the interviewers have either tablets or phones, a software that, that we work with, one of, the, one of the several that we work with, um, and several add-ons that I could talk about later uh, that allow us to do all sorts of quality control with respect to the, to the interview. The data from the project, if you're not aware and you'd like to use the data, are freely available. You can download them off of our website. Um, and important for this 
particular project. The samples are designed with a um, stratification by major subregion. Okay? This is the case of Bolivia, where we have stratified the country into the nine departments. It's the only country in the sample where the uh, stratification maps onto the departments. Uh, in all other cases, the stratification is a bit larger than that, so that within one uh, unit, you have several states or departments. In Bolivia, we have the nine departments represented, so we select proportional to size out of each of those departments to create the national sample. It's weighted to, to make sure that it's nationally representative when we're looking at it at that level. But at the subnational level, then each, uh, each, each department has enough survey data in it drawn proportional size to give us a sense of the context of that subregion. So for example, and the dots here are, are um, from one year of our study where we uh, have mapped it out here. So each dot is a sample area, is a, is a cluster of surveys. This allows us to do things like this. From the survey itself, extrapolate up, and we can determine that in 2014, the crime rate in Cochabamba among adults, um, because that's who we're surveying, uh, was 25%. So uh, one out of every four individuals who responded to the survey who live in the department of Cochabamba said that they'd been the victim of a crime in the past year. In, in Osuro, that rate was 15%. So there's this variation across region. We, can, we do this as well with the economic variable. We asked people whether or not their household experienced income loss. We, extrapolate up and we can get an indicator of the economic context in which the individual lives. So this is what the model looks like then. We have a uh, measure of crime victimization, household income deterioration at the individual level, uh, news consumption at the individual level, the region year crime victimization rate, the interaction, and then a region year income deterioration uh, rate. We have then 300 uh, observations at the second level. So for those who like multi-level modeling, this approach is very nice because if we just looked at countries, we just have 18 Latin American countries. Right? Um, here, because we have a, a number of years, we take the about 100 subregions in those 18 countries, and we have multiple rounds. So we get up to 300 level two observations, and then almost 70,000 uh, level one observations. We also include controls for gender, education, age, uh, skin tone, whether or not they live in an urban or rural area, and um, wealth, uh, country year, or country fixed effects and year fixed effects are also in the model. So what do the results look like? I'm gonna show you, but it's a logistic model, so it's not even gonna help that much, except that I've got stars um, on everything. Um, so, so bear with me. Essentially, we find support for, for the expectations that, that I laid out. Here we can see uh, the impact, the predicted impact from the model of being victimized yourself and as an individual by crime in the past year or having lost income controlling for your other circumstances. And you can see that there's this marginal uptick in your likelihood of prioritizing security if you've been the victim of a, of a crime. Um, a marginal decrease if your household has experienced income deterioration, presumably because you're prioritizing the economy. Right? And then the regional measures are here too and they have slightly more substantial uh, effects on, on people's likelihood or uh, decreased likelihood for the economic factor of prioritizing security issues. And then we want to look at the interaction. So this is the interaction that, that we were positing. Um, surprisingly, we found what we expected, as people don't tend to get up here if they, if they haven't, right? Um, so what we see is that there's a positive effect. This is mapping out for you the, the predicted effect of, of news consumption on the dependent variable, which is this, do you prioritize security as a top issue facing the country or something else? And you can see here that there's a positive effect of consuming news for those who live in low crime regions. The x-axis runs from zero to one simply because we recoded that variable onto a zero one scale so that uh, these values down closer to zero represent the lower crime regions, and those toward one represent the higher crime regions. And so you can see that crime or, or that um, news consumption has essentially no uh, effect on people's likelihood of prioritizing security if they live in a high crime region. Again, as I said before, they don't need the news to tell them that crime is a serious problem for the country. 
right? It's not affecting just them. It's affecting all these people around them. They drive through it. They walk through it every day. They see it, right? But for these people who live in these safer regions, news persuades them that, that, that this is an important issue facing the country. So this helps us to resolve this puzzle of Uruguay, where across these two very different contexts, the same proportion of people prioritize security. It turns out that uh, our news consumption measure is a five-point measure, going from you know, sort of ne never consume any news, which very few people say, to you consume news uh, every day. And if we take the, the, the fourth and fifth categories, the ones that are sort of toward, you know, mean that you consume a lot of news together, what we see is that across both the interior and the capital in, in, in uh, Uruguay, the capital of Montevideo, 94% of people in both locations report paying attention to the news several times a week or more. So that's the last two categories combined together. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly skewed variable. Um, it's skewed in most countries, but it's particularly skewed in Uruguay. Right? So um, news saturation is very high in Uruguay, and it leads to this homogenation of preferences. There's a um, sort of rival interpretation of this type of, of result. I keep talking about the news changing people's priorities, persuading them to adopt security as an issue that should be at the top of the national agenda. But another possibility is that those people in the interior who've been reading the news are now scared. Right? So it's not because they see news about crime in Montevideo and they think, OK, I don't live there, but this is obviously a big problem for our country. Uh, instead, they read the news and they think, I'm terrified. We need to fix this. Right? So we looked at this. If, we're, if that's the mechanism, if it's fear, then we should find a parallel relationship by which consuming news in low crime areas leads to greater fear of crime, right? So, so we asked this question. This is um, one of my former students and now research staffers, Mariana in, in Venezuela. This is what it looks like often now when we go out to do uh, field research in Latin America. A lot more people behind bars than used to be behind bars. Um, is, is this relationship that I just talked about being driven by a similar process by which fear of crime is being influenced by consumption of news in low crime areas. We have a question on the survey that asks people, speaking of the neighborhood where you live and thinking about the possibility of being assaulted or robbed, do you feel very safe, somewhat safe, somewhat unsafe, or very unsafe uh, in response to that question? So we coded it from 0 to 100 in this case. Um, very unsafe, low values, very safe, high values. And then we reran the model to take a look at whether or not using that as our dependent variable got us the same result, right? And the answer is no. So what we see here is that on the low crime end of this x-axis, consuming news has no effect on your fear of crime. This is counter to a lot of conventional wisdom that the media fans the flames of fear in, in, in places where people otherwise should not be more afraid. Okay. But if you consume more news while living in a high crime area, it does resonate with you, and it does make you a bit more fearful. Right? So it, 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 you're sort of sensitized to it. It seems more relevant. You become a bit more, more afraid. So that's what I've got to sum up our conclusions. Crime victimization and economic circumstances, though looked at only marginally here, um, influence the public agenda. Context matters more than individual experiences. The media sets the agenda by diffusing the prioritization of security to comparatively safe areas. But this is not a travel to fear of crime, which we say is evidence of an often, un often underdetected rationality in the public. So perhaps, as my colleague Larry Bartel says, the public is often not rational. But in this case, uh, the public does indeed seem to be quite rational in how they respond. And that's it.